better? Okay. Okay, good. Thank you. Well, hello again. Glad to be with you. Um, I came down this week and told my wife, I said, I'll, I'll be speaking at Shepherd's Bowl again Saturday. And she goes, oh, that's great. And I said, no, that's not. I've got nothing. <laughs> I usually keep something in the chamber in case I'm called to speak somewhere. I've got something, but I have nothing. But then I remember what I said last week. The Lord is my shepherd. If I need it, I'll have it. Right. So 5.30 this morning, I had it. <laughs> so, uh, so that's what we're going to be sharing with you today. I spoke to a group of uh, middle schoolers not too long ago, and one of them said, where's your iPad? Because uh, everybody that speaks in front of them has an iPad, and, and I said, uh, I have a legal pad. <laughs> and so, they didn't know what that was. It wasn't even funny to them. But anyway, um, so we're going we're gonna to share a little bit today, and, and uh, I'm going to learn along with you. I can, I can tell you that. Um, I'm going to start by reading in James chapter 4, uh, verse 1. We're going to be jumping around a little bit today, uh, but James chapter 4, just verse 1 to start. Okay. It says, what causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions or desires are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. I'm going to stop right there. I think if we look at our society today, one of the biggest issues or concerns that we have is that of division. I've never, and I'm, I'm not old, I'm not young, I'm 58, but I've never seen the world so divisive as it is now. I mean, it used to be as Americans, we could have Republicans and Democrats, but if somebody attacked us, we were one. You know, we could come together. And it used to be bigger. It used to be country versus country, or party versus party, or group versus group, but now it, it has got down to mask versus no mask, and vax versus no vax, and people are fighting, people are fighting in public, literally fisticuffs over mask or no mask, jab or no jab, whatever. There is so much division, and you look at it, you watch the news, it can really bring you down. But in truth, as disciples of Christ, this gives us a perfect opportunity to be a light in this world of darkness. It gives us an opportunity to do what we were commissioned to do, which would be ministers of reconciliation, of bringing people together and not dividing people. So we do have that, that chance to be this ministers of, of reconciliation. So how do we do this? Well, first I'm going to cast a big net by sending us to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I'm going to read most of that, uh, if not all. And probably all, but bear with me. Paul is writing, If I speak in tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm a noisy gong and a gang or a gang clanging symbol. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, now think about that. If I have all knowledge and, all, and understand all mysteries, if I have all faith, so as to move mountains, let's say I could move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all that I have away, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Now it starts to describe what love is. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. Let's think about James there. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, and endures all things. So this is what love does. Now remember I was at a uh, promise keeper's event, which is a men's event, if you're not familiar with it. Thousands of men gather from all over the country, and it's a men's retreat, if you want to uh, call it that. But it's a weekend. 
And I remember a, a pastor talking about this particular, he was talking about marriage, and he, he brought this up, and he says, what I want you to do is rewrite this, and I want you to go home and put your name and your wife's name in this passage. Ray is, my wife's name is Angela. Ray is patient with Angela. Ray is kind with Angela. Ray does not boast in front of Angela, is not arrogant or rude. You get the point. Uh, I tried that. It lasted about two days. There was a problem somewhere. But then I started looking at this. It doesn't say that Ray does any of that. What does it say does that? Love. Love does that. Ray doesn't do that. Ray can't do that. Not in his own power. It'd be like I, I noticed my Toyota truck registers 120 miles an hour. I don't know that it'll do that. I've not had it that fast. But it registers 120, so I'm going to assume that it can go 120 miles an hour. So let's say I read, a, I read a, a brochure that says this Toyota Tacoma can go 120 miles an hour. And then I try to put my name in it and go, Ray can go 120 miles an hour. Ray cannot run 120 miles an hour. What Ray needs to obtain if he wants to go 120 miles an hour is a Toyota truck. So if Ray wants to be patient, if he wants to be kind, if he doesn't want to act like a jerk, if he wants to bear all things, he needs to let Ray go and he needs to obtain love. Well, what is love? God is love. And we need to let God permeate our system until we are operating out of love in a natural way. Way. We're not gritting our teeth. I'm going to be patient today. I'm going to get up and be patient with my wife. I'm going to be patient with my kids. It is a natural thing. It's a progression that we start at salvation and we are progressing, being transformed, sanctified into Christ likeness. I liken it to this. I wrestled in high school and I went out my eighth grade year and I had some natural talent for wrestling, according to the older wrestlers and the coach. And I began a progression of becoming a wrestler to, uh, to a, a champion wrestler at the, at the end of my progression. But my first year, I wrestled. My second year, I wrestled. My third year, I wrestled. My fourth year, my, the fifth year I wrestled, I felt like a wrestler. And what I mean is, up till then, if you grabbed my arm, I had to think, what do I do to get out of this arm lock? But by the time I had wrestled for five years, I didn't think about it anymore. It was just a natural reaction. If you throw a ball at my face, I'm going to naturally react. What we want to do is we want to obtain love. We want to let God permeate ourselves to such a place where it is a natural reaction for us to be patient, for us to be kind, for us to show love. But then we have to ask ourselves, do I want love? And you would think, well, that's a stupid question. No, not really. Not really. Let's think about this. Do I want to be patient with the guy who just cut me off in traffic? Do I want that? Do I want to give up all envy and boasting? Do I want to give away my chance to sarcastically respond to somebody and be rude? Do I really want to bear all things? Do I really want to endure all things? We have to ask ourselves a question, a serious question. Do I want this? Is, do I want my life to be this? Some people, if you ask them, I can get, I can tell them, I give you a pill, and if you take it, you'll never be angry again. They would not take the pill. Because anger has become their weapon, their protection, their identity, and they don't want to give it up. So to obtain love, we have to give ourselves up. We have to surrender our kingdom into the kingdom of God. But let's say we, we say yes to that. Then I want to get a little more specific of how we can be ministers of reconciliation and, and, uh, and stop a lot of the division among us. You know, there's even divisions in our church. There's thousands of denominations, and I'm not saying anything bad about denominations. I think they have their place. But if you get on a Christian blog sometimes and watch Christians, disciples of Christ, fight on the Internet, somebody who doesn't know Christ would say, I don't, I don't need that. I don't want that. Look at these people. 
They're cutting themselves off from within. It reminds me of an old joke of a Baptist pastor who was lost at sea, and they, they wrote him off for dead. Well, ten years later, they found him on this tropical island, and he was lived. He lived for ten years by himself. And they said, uh, this, is, this is incredible. How did you do this? He said, well, God was gracious. It's a tropical climate. I had plenty of fruits and nuts and fish. And they said, yeah, but you just didn't survive. You thrived. You've built these huts, these, these, these structures here. What, what is all this all about? He said, well, this first structure is where I sleep. It's, it's reinforced. Animals can't get into it. This is my place of rest. So that's great. He said, well, what's this next one? He said, well, this is, this is where I cook and you know, take care of daily activities and, and that way the food is not where my, I sleep so the animals stay away, that, that's good. What's this third structure? He said, oh, that's where I go to church. I wanted a place to worship God. I wanted a structure where I could go to church. I said, well, that's beautiful. What's this fourth structure? He said, that's where I used to go to church. <laughs> <laughs> so we can have divisions in the church, right? In fact, I've always thought if you if you name your church First Baptist, aren't you already planning for a split? <laughs> right? First Baptist, oh, we were here first. All right. Enough with the quote unquote comedy. Let's look at Matthew. We're, we're going to gloss over Matthew 5 through 7, which is the teachings of Jesus, known as the Sermon on the Mount. Now, many were gathered at that time. Excuse me, let me find it. And, you know, we see it in the movies and, and all this kind of stuff. And any of y'all watch The Chosen, by the way? Kind of a commercial. Isn't it? Oh, I, I just love it. I've seen every episode of season one at least eight times. Uh, I'll come in sometime and answer, what do you want for TV? I said, I just need some Jesus today. Just turn Jesus on and, uh, and we'll Mind. But we see, you know, movies and, and things like The Chosen where these crowds gather together and they're all just kind of floating around, seems like, on, in the fields and stuff. But we have to remember who was gathered here during this time. This crowd that gathered to see Jesus was a multi, multiple person, group of people crowd. There was the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes, the tax collectors, the degenerates. The hungry, the rich, the, uh, uh, it would be the equivalent of us getting a, a group together today and it being the Democrat Party, the Republican Party, the uh, Russians and the Chinese and the Hells Angels and the Black Lives Matter and the skinheads. It was a, it was a crowd of a bunch of people, very divisive. So now Jesus is going to teach this crowd. So what does he do? He starts teaching, and, and we have to know that his teaching is a progression. And I'm going to start just in the progression part of it in 521. And the first thing he says is get rid of anger. Don't be angry. And again, we can't do that on our own. We have to uh, count on the grace of God for that. But if we get rid of anger, and after we get rid of anger and contempt, we get rid of lust. I want what I want to, I'm trying to do right here. I would do this in a five-part series if I had the chance, but I don't. So uh, we get rid of lust. If we get rid of anger, contempt, and lust, divorce will, will go away. 98% of divorces will go away if everybody got rid of anger, contempt, and lust. Oaths means you don't try to manipulate people with slick words. Retaliation is vengeance. Love your enemies. And it talks about giving, then it talks about praying, fasting, laying up treasures. Don't be anxious. I want to jump a little bit further now to chapter 7. And I want to talk about one way, just one, there are many, that we as disciples of Christ can be ministers of reconciliation. And that is this. Jesus says, judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, what that means is, let's say that uh, my son's 31 now, so he's, he's out, he's gone, he's off the payroll. But let's say he was home, and I come in, and his room is messed up. I mean, it's total chaos, as generally it was. 
and I just get on him and I start judging. You're, you're one of the laziest people I know. Can't you pick up your stuff? Why can't you do this? Your mom works so hard and she washes your clothes and you just throw them around all up, ba, 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 ba. And then I go down to my basement later on that day and my son is standing in my messy basement going, the same measure that I used to judge him, now he's turned around to judge me. And so that's what Jesus is saying. Don't judge because whatever you judge can be used against you in the same measure. Why do you see the speck in your brother's eye but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. First off, how does Jesus know that I have a, how does it say in this translation? log. How does Jesus know that I have a log in my eye? I may be a straight shooter. I may be straight up and down, total obedience to God. How does he know that I have a log in my eye? I will say this. This is what I think. The minute that my mind, my spirit, my will starts to judge another human being with anger and contempt, I have a log in my eye. Doesn't matter how, didn't we just say, I could have all knowledge, I could have faith to move mountains. Once my desire to set somebody straight overrides my love thy neighbor as thyself, I'm wrong. I've got a log in my eye. I was talking to a pastor a friend of mine this week. He said, man, I really got humbled this week. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, there's a guy at my church and uh, was a faithful attender, and then COVID hit, and you know, he's, he's not been back. Even though we're back meeting again, he's not been back. And I'm a little disappointed in him. You know, he was talking to somebody, so I was a little disappointed in him. And the guy he was talking to says, well, you know he has one kidney, and he's trying to be extra careful with his health. And so the pastor friend of mine said, man, I just got humbled. You know, I was judging him without knowing the whole story. You know, I'm thinking, well, he just don't want to come to church, and now he's got lazy, and he didn't even love the Lord or whatever, but he was taking extra care of his health because of a situation. I was talking to a young man the other day, and he has a friend that uh, he went to high school with. It's a female, it's not his girlfriend, but he, he said, I, she's living with the guy. And he said, I think I'm going to give her a call and set her straight. And he said, what do you think about it? And when somebody asks me what I think about it, I'll give you one out. I'll say, are you really asking? <laughs> and that gives you a chance to say, no, I'm not. Forget it. I didn't say anything. But if you say, yes, I'm really asking, then I'm going to tell you. I said, well, here's my, here's my thought. I said, I think that we are saved at salvation. And our goal is to become, like we talked about last week, Christ-like. I think the only two things that keep us from perfection of Christ-likeness is our mind and our body. And once our mind and body, our brain and our body is gone, we can be perfect. But our goal is to be transformed somewhere along this line to where we're more Christ-like today than we were yesterday and so forth and so on. I looked at him and said, I have never found my, and everybody's on a different spot. I said, I have never found a spot on that grid for me that allows me to straighten somebody out. Now, if somebody came to me and said, hey, I'm, my life is this and that, what do you think? Then I'd once again say, are you asking me? <laughs> and if they said yes, then, then I might say something, but it wouldn't be in judgment. They've asked me. Jesus goes, on, I'm sorry about this. Uh, Jesus goes on to talk about this. Um, he says, do not give the dogs what is holy. And do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and attack you. Now, uh, I told you last week that I, I studied the Bible from first century Jerusalem. And uh, it's been very eye-opening, particularly in a verse like this. When we talk about uh, pigs and dogs, that was the term used by Jews to, uh, for non-Jews. It wasn't as derogatory as our English makes it sound. They weren't calling each other pigs and dogs as we would understand that. It was just basically like me saying, I'm an American, you're not an American. 
So the American Constitution doesn't apply to somebody who's not American. That's that's basically what it said. So a pearl was something when you when you studied under a rabbi and you gave these wisdoms, it was called pearls of wisdom. And you strung your pearl, it was called stringing pearls. I would follow my rabbi, in my case, my rabbi is Jesus, and so he teaches me something, and I remember it, and I, I, that's a pearl. And then I, I put those together, and that's how I, it was called stringing pearls. Well, that's what he's talking about with pearls. He says, don't cast your pearls before the swine or the dogs. And what he was basically saying in today's terms, let's say that you and I went to uh, Phil's Dream Pit, okay, barbecue. And I'm a Jew, and I order the pulled beef platter. And then you order, you're non-Jew, you order the pulled pork. And I throw a fit. Man, don't you understand that is against the word of God, that's against the holy Torah, the law of God. You're not supposed to eat. Yeah. You know, well, you may tell me what to do with my pulled beef, you know, because that doesn't apply to you. Or if, let's say, I went to an atheist convention, thousands of atheists gathered, and I've got a bullhorn and a sign that says all atheists are going to hell. Right? Uh, I'm liable to be found beat to death <laughs> in the middle of a bunch of atheists. This is what Jesus is saying when he said, don't cast your, don't share these pearls of wisdom with people who are not ready to receive it. There will be a time for that. There will be a time of reconciliation. But it's not then. It's not then. Don't judge. So then what are we supposed to do? I told you this is written in a succession. And so we start reading in 7. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And the one who seeks finds. And the one who knocks it will be opened. And he talks about how God is good and will give us what we ask for. This obviously can pertain to prayer. I'm asking, I asked God this week, I need something to say uh, Saturday. I need something to say. And he gave it to me. But if we talk about this in progression, we just got through, he's just got through saying, don't give your dogs what is holy. Don't throw your pearls before the swine. And so all these people are going, so what are we supposed to do? And he's saying, ask. Ask before you judge. Ask before I judge the fact that that guy wasn't coming to church. Wonder why he's not coming to church. And God reveals to me, oh, he's got one kidney. So now I can pray for his health. I can pray that he, uh, uh, that this COVID thing goes away and allows him to come back in. And see that reconciliation, it's not judgment, it's reconciliation. Now I'm going to close here in just a minute with an example that I think is pretty controversial. And I hope it's taken in the, and, and I'm going to try to explain it as good as I can. I hope it's taken in the spirit that it's, that it's meant to be. You may have heard of this guy. I read about him on the internet. He uh, attends uh, gay pride festivities with a booth set up that has a banner. And then he has a shirt that says free dad hugs. And he offers free dad hugs. If somebody comes up, he says, I'm a dad, and I love you. And he hugs them. And how this came to be was this guy, who is a Christian, he's a disciple of Christ, started thinking, started asking, if I was a 19-year-old male, and my father kicked me out of the house, told me never to come back, and I'll never speak to you again, you're dead to me, how would I feel? Who would I talk to about buying a car? Where to go to college? Or what if it was just a bad day and I just needed a man in my life to hug me and say it's going to be okay? How would that feel? And so he decided that this was what he was going to do. And he shows up at these places with a booth. He says he has held young men for as high as 30 minutes while they just cry because nobody's ever said they love them. Now, half of his Criticism has come from the church. How can you do that? And his answer is this. I'm not condoning what they're doing. I'm not condemning what they're doing. I've been given two commands. Love God and love people. And that's what I do. 
So once again, he's not condemning. And he's not condoning. He's living out the life of Christ, loving God and loving people. Now let me ask you this. When we talk about division and reconciliation, when we talk about being ministers of reconciliation, we talk about love God and love people. Who is more apt to bring people together to cut the tension and more importantly to entice people into the kingdom of God? The man at the convention with the sign that says you're all going to hell and screaming at people. Or the guy at the convention that says free dad hugs. I'm going to go with the free dad hugs guy. And again, half of his criticism is from the church. Why would you go there? Well, Jesus would go there. Jesus went there. Jesus ate with the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the downcast the quote-unquote sinners. That's where Jesus was found. If you want to find Jesus, that's where you found him. He taught in the temple, but he lived out the law in the daily world. And that's what we're asked to do. And so I would just challenge us, before we judge, we get on our knees and ask, what makes this person, what's going on with this person? I had an enemy recently, I don't know if I mentioned it last week or not, I apologize if I repeated it, but I ask that same question. How do you see him, Lord? This, this man is very educated. Very well known, very... And God showed me, he said, I see him like the Wizard of Oz. If you ever watch the Wizard of Oz, when they get to the wizard, it's all flash and bang and pow, but there's really just a little man behind the curtain that says, do not look behind the curtain. And what I saw was a man who has all the flash and bang, but I saw him as a weak little man behind the curtain praying that nobody sees him for who he is. And so I pray for him every day that God will give him an encounter with him, with God, that will allow him to see him how God sees him. And uh, that's what I pray for an enemy of mine. Now I'm not saying that to be self-righteous because for two nights, I uh, think I did tell you this last week. I didn't pray for him. I beat him up in an elevator for two nights in a row. Just kept going over my head. But anyway, what I'm saying is this. Before you judge, I challenge you. Do what Jesus said. Ask, what's going on in this person's life? How can I be a minister of reconciliation? What's a need that I can meet? And together, this is what Jesus started over 2,000 years ago the divine conspiracy to overcome evil with good. Not with more evil, not with more violence, not with more judgment, not with more arguing. Overcome evil with good, which is love. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that uh, you, get, you teach us. You don't leave us to wonder about what we can do in certain situations. The words you spoke over 2,000 years ago are as relevant and alive as they are today, as today's newspaper. And we just ask, Father, I ask personally, that you would give me the grace, the power to do what I can't do on my own, to operate out of your love, out of your mercy, and out of your kindness and grace to those people around me, that I might be a, recon uh, a minister of reconciliation, Folks here may be ministers of reconciliation in their family, at the grocery store, at the gas station, at Walgreens, wherever they go. May they carry the, the ministry of reconciliation with them. May they carry your love with them. May we all do that because that's how your kingdom is built. That's how you wanted it built. And so we ask that you'd make us active participants in that. In Jesus' name, amen. And thank you folks again for your time.